Who was Adolf Galland? How did he become the youngest general in World War II? And what made him stand out as a combat leader? Hello, I'm Colin Heaton, former Army and Marine sniper, and today we'll be covering the career and the life of General Adolf Galland, fighter tactician and leader on this episode of Forgotten History. Adolf Galland was born on March 19, 1912, the second of four brothers. His father and mother were apparently strict disciplinarians, but he looked upon that as being a positive thing when he decided in 1931 that he was going to join the new fledgling Luftwaffe, which at that time was still illegal in Germany. After his training advanced, he had a crash as a student pilot and for the rest of his life still had the, resi the residual effects of having powdered glass from the instrument panel in his right eye. Uh, his acumen and natural flying skill brought him to the attention of his superiors. So much so that when Hitler decided to support Francisco Franco in the Spanish Civil War fighting against the government of Spain, Gallen was one of the first officers selected to go to Spain with the famous Condor Legion to fly combat, air patrols, and tactical ground support missions. While in Spain, Adolf Galland flew tactical air support against the communist forces supported by Joseph Stalin in the Soviet Union. After his tour was over, he met Werner Mulders, his replacement, whom he did not like at first and didn't really trust because Werner Mulders was a very strict Catholic, didn't smoke, didn't drink, and carried a Bible. Gallen and Mulders later did become the best of friends after Spain and when World War II broke out in 1939. Werner Mulders would become the most successful fighter pilot in the Spanish Civil War, shooting down 14 aircraft. By the time he died, he had 114 confirmed aerial victories. He and Gallen both flew their missions, flying their independent squadrons in the battles of France and the Battle of Britain. Both of them became household names, and due to their rapid success, both of them were the first recipients of the Oakley Swords and Diamonds to the Knight's Cross. Later, Galland was placed on a short staff job, which he hated, and begged to go back to combat. Mulders was then sent to the Eastern Front in 1941 for Operation Barbarossa. Upon the suicide of General Ernst Udet, the famous World War I ace, the top surviving German ace of that war. Mulders is flying back for the state funeral. His HE-111 bomber, in which he was a passenger, crashed and he was killed. At the funeral, Goering turned to Gallen and said, you're his replacement, you are now the new general of the fighters. Galland at that time was only 29 years old and a full colonel. Galland would later find out that with that promotion came a lot of responsibility, but it also came with a lot of heartache. Due to Adolf Gallen receiving the diamonds, he was taken off of combat flying status, mainly because of the propaganda value, but also because of his strategic value and his tactical knowledge and his tactical innovations. He and Mulders had basically rewritten air combat doctrine for the Luftwaffe. And upon taking his desk in Berlin, Gallen found out that his two brothers who had finished flight school were now fighter pilots, Paul and Wilhelm. The heartbreak would continue because both of these men, successful fighter pilots, Wilhelm with the Knight's Cross, uh, would be killed in action. But then it continued. Galland later began hearing rumors about the concentration camps. He knew of Dachau, he knew of some of the others where political prisoners had been kept, but it wasn't really an, a well-known fact of what was going on. Galland then had the occasion to meet several of his old friends from Spain, Gunter Lutzow, who was a colonel and a very highly decorated, successful fighter pilot. Eduard Neumann, whom he flew with in Spain, who was the commanding officer of a rebellious young Hans Joachim Marseille. 
uh, many of the other pilots that uh, Gallen flew with, the people he felt he could trust, were part of his inner circle. Hitler called him into a meeting after the Scharnhorst and Gneisenau mission called Operation Cerberus. This was the Channel Dash in 1942, when the two bat pocket battleships were trying to navigate the English Channel to return to Germany for repairs after a tour in the North Atlantic. Gallen basically planned the entire tactical air umbrella operation to protect those two ships. And it worked to such perfection, Hitler brought him to Berlin and wanted to interview him and talk to him and, and basically give him more responsibility. As general of the fighters, Adolf Gallen had a great responsibility. He was in charge of assignments and officer appointments and making sure that the, the fighter force received everything it needed, from fuel to ammunition to parachutes, pilots. He scoured the entire occupied nations, interviewing and talking to his commanding squadron leaders and group leaders and wanting to get the feel for how they felt about the war. He cared about his men and he wanted to know what, what their thoughts were. When he went to uh, do his report to General Hans Jaschonik in 1943, Gallen basically was complaining that the Luftwaffe in North Africa had never received what they needed. The Luftwaffe in the, on the Russian front in the Eastern Campaign was suffering horrendous losses. And now, with the U.S. Army 8th Air Force operating out of, out of uh, Great Britain, that uh, German fighter pilots in the West were having a difficult time and uh, needed more support and, and basically the resources to fight the war. These fell on deaf ears with Yashanik, who later committed suicide uh, in the summer of 43. And Gallen became very disillusioned with Hermann Goering's leadership of the Luftwaffe. And he began to talk to his superiors, such as uh, the general staff in the army that respected him, but didn't trust Goering at all. In 1943, Colonel Curtis E. LeMay, later General LeMay, had changed the doctrine for flying bomber formations from a stream into a box formation, mainly because the German fighters were able to hit them from the flank and the rear, causing great losses amongst the fighter forces. The two battles of schweinfurt Regensburg in August and October of 1943 saw the U.S. lose over 120 B-17s, each, each bomber carrying a 10-man crew. LeMay devised a new box tactic that was adopted throughout the entire Air Force. However, in January of 1944, a new man came on the scene to take command of the 8th Air Force. That was General James Doolittle, famous for his Tokyo raid in April of 1942. Unlike his predecessors, who wanted to keep the fighters strictly close to the bombers to protect them, Doolittle talked to his fighter leaders, such as Hub Zimke, and he decided to let the fighter leaders dictate the terms of action. And the new tactic was for the fighter forces to go deeper into Germany a couple of hours ahead of the bombers to draw the German fighters up, who would normally lay back and wait for the fighters to turn back when they were short on fuel. Then they would attack the bombers. In January of 44, the P-51D Mustang with the Rolls Merlin engine now had the range to actually engage German aircraft and stay in the fight for up to eight hours. Gallen found out that his Luftwaffe force was being torn to pieces by this new tactic of letting fighter, American fighters and British fighters roam deep into Germany and hit their airfields, lure them into combat. And after the war, Adolf Gallen said that my greatest enemy is my friend, General James Doolittle. He cost me more pilots than anything else, but he was a good leader and a good man to his nation. Adolf Gallen's meteoric career going from a basic aviation cadet in the early 30s to being awarded the Spanish cross with sword and gold with swords and diamonds by Francisco Franco to receiving all of Germany's highest decorations for valor and becoming, by the end of the war, a lieutenant general at age 32. He scored 104 victories in 705 missions. His last victories were when he was commanding his own personal squadron, JV-44, in 1945, with Hitler's permission, after the failed fighters' revolt of January of that year, Galland 
Johannes Steinhoff, Günther Lutzow, and many other of the fighter leaders had rebelled against Göring for a second time. At this point, Göring was so frustrated, he threatened to have them all court-martialed and executed for treason. Hitler got involved, and finally he sided with Galland and said to Göring, let Galland do what he can with the jets. I'm out of this. It's over. After the war, Galland was captured, and he was treated hospitably. Why? Because he was a very chivalrous fighter. In 1941, when the legendary legless fighter pilot Sir Douglas Bader bailed out of his aircraft that was shot down, his artificial legs were damaged. One was left in the cockpit and one was destroyed upon landing under parachute. Galland contacted Goering and they had permission for the RAF to fly over and drop a replacement set of artificial legs for Bader as a, as a gesture of goodwill, which they did along with a few bombs on his runway. But the British never forgot that. Uh, he was so well respected that his son, Andreas Hubertus, has a very unique godfather. The, one of the top British aces of World War II, Robert Standard Tuck, became the godfather to Galland's son. Galland later was recruited after the war to go to Argentina at the request of President Juan Perón to help him create the Argentine Air Force, utilizing material, aircraft, tactics, and giving Argentina a world-class air force. Lieutenant General Adolf Galland emerged from the war as one of the most famous and well-respected German fighter pilots in history. Heralded by his former enemies, he was always welcomed in the United States, the United Kingdom, and around the world to give lectures, give talks, and he was very gracious with his time giving interviews. He died February 9th, 1996. If you enjoyed this segment on Forgotten History, please click like, subscribe, and leave your comments, and we will respond to comments as soon as we can. And thank you.